Mm-hmm. Hello, Elise. Hey, Bo. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Jacob just uh, told me to get the meeting started, but then I noticed you did, so perfect. <laughs> yep, I just wanted to make sure we were getting on and having everybody here on time. Let's see, Do we have people in the waiting room. Yeah, I just let a few in. Don's here. Josh is here. Kathy. Welcome. Hi, Don. Hi, everybody. Hi, Kathy. Hello. Uh, Jacob will be here very shortly. Um, uh, he just wanted us to jump on and get the meeting started. So happy Friday, everybody. I think Emily is coming on as well to do a market update. Is that right, Bo? Uh, yes, she should be coming on shortly as well. Yeah. Perfect. So how is everybody today? It's a crazy day, just like every other day. Yep. <laughs> it's a good day in Utah. Mm-hmm. Pretty day. No, no hurricanes, no tornadoes. It's a no, no big fires. It's it, it's a good day. There you go. Yeah. Hello, Miss Emily. How are you? There she is. Welcome, Emily. I guess it'd be nice if I can unmute, unmute myself so you guys can hear me. How are you guys doing? <laughs> Fantastic. Happy Friday. Same to you. Same to you. Emily, we were just saying Jacob's jumping on when he can. He's run a few minutes behind, but now that you're here, we'll probably let you go ahead and get started for a market update a little bit. Awesome. So who's running the show? You are? <laughs> All right, cool, cool, cool. So am I ready? To, am I all set to go? I can I can get started? Whenever you would like, yeah. Oh, yay, all right. Who wants to give me screen share privileges? Do I already have that? How do I do it, Elise? You, I'm, I was trying to do it, but you may need to. Okay. Um, since you switch over to the host, uh, so you, we'll just go over to participants and you can make Emily a co-host or a host. Got it. Okay. Make a co-host. There we go. Why, well, hello everybody. How are you today? We're fine. There he is. Welcome. There's nothing quite like coming into a room where you're talking and first you're muted and then everybody's trying to come in. You're like reading lips, you know? Is anybody else like a big lip reader and is having the worst time with all these masks everywhere? Like, I don't understand what you were saying anyway when I go through the drive through at the bank. Now I can't see your face. Ugh. It's okay. I'll be all right. I took my medicine. Hi, Emily. Are you done? <laughs> Oh, just go, Chuck. Are you feeling okay? I'm good. I'm good. How are you guys doing? You haven't covered that already? What were you doing this whole two minutes I was trying to park my car? Yeah, oh, we were getting ready to let her get started. <laughs> In that case, did you see that Mr. Don Pendleton is here already? Did you say hi? Hi. Oh. I'm excited to be part of your group today. Thank you. I, well, I will not take up a lot of time so that I can let Don do his thing. I want to listen to this one myself. So let's quickly take a look at the economic numbers and information that we have for this week. Um, it was a slow week up until we got to yesterday. Yesterday, obviously, was Thursday. So we had um, the unemployment claims. And as you guys can see, it's pretty much unchanged from where we were last week. So really nothing much in terms of that. We're still at that million dollar range in terms of um, you know, new unemployment claims, again, pretty much nothing to see. Um, the central bank did have their annual Jackson Hole meeting, which was kind of virtual. They really didn't meet there, but it was virtual. And they were talking about, you know, um, what the implications are for the monetary policy, you know, uh, uh, in the future. And it was live on YouTube. If you guys want to go back and catch it. Morgan Stanley. I was just calling because... I don't know. That wasn't me. Oops. <laughs> Somebody's getting a voicemail. <laughs> um, so if you guys want to catch that, um, you certainly can. I'll put the link in the chat. And 
I think I'm the admin now, so I have to let people in. So let me let somebody in. Somebody's trying to get in. Let me add them in. Um, so if you guys want to take a look at that, you certainly can. But basically the bottom line or like, you know, what you can take out of it, the synopsis of it was the, you know, their they announced a major shift in how they are going to achieve maximum employment and um, stable prices. So what their approach is going to be is that they are going to, number one, they're not going to uh, obviously increase uh, interest rates. The interest rates are going to remain unchanged for quite some time. Um, they have a goal to obviously reach maximum uh, employment and plan to keep inflation uh, around that 2% uh, two percent range. Uh, basically, uh, what they said is that they would not be raising interest rates anytime soon and would not be increasing rates um, even as unemployment levels strengthen. Now, if you guys study economics, if you just know the gist of what happens uh, prior to this announcement, is that when the economy is good and we have you know, uh, low unemployment and the labor economy, the, the labor market is, is strong and the economy is strong, the Fed typically will raise interest rates. When the, when the um, unemployment rate is high and the economy is bad, they do the reverse where they lower interest rates to boost the economy, to get people to go out and spend money and all the other good stuff. What they pretty much said is that they will, they will not be doing that. So even if the labor market is doing well and even if um, the economy is doing well, they do not foresee in increasing interest rates in the near future. So that changes things in terms of how, um, how they used to make those adjustments. Um, what that means overall for the market, I guess, is yet to be determined. But obviously, I think that's a, you know, it's going to be probably a good thing for um, the market. But once again, still to be determined. But that's kind of like what the gist of that meeting was yesterday. Um, what that does to the market, the market this week, you know, everybody, everything kind of like tapered off. We were just kind of waiting to hear what the announcement would be. So there really wasn't that much um, shift in the, in the market. But we did uh, make new highs in the S&P. So I'm going to share that you guys can take a look at that real quick. And for those of you guys that are in the stock, uh, stock survivor. Uh, survivor. I was trying to, th I was trying to think of the word stock survivor. Uh, you guys have been seeing us talk about this, this, you know, the past few days, but you know, here is the S&P 500, and you know, we talked about this many, many times, whether, you know, if we were going to break out at that old high where we were back in February. And as you can see, we have broken that out and we continue to make new highs. So again, the market is just doing its thing, um, you know, and we're just, we're just going to keep, you know, trading whatever the trend is until it's no longer the trend. So that's what's happening this week in terms of that. Um, individual company announcements, um, Coca-Cola, MGM, and I want to say United Airlines um, announced that they were going to be having some layoffs. Um, what that means is that it's, you know, obviously bad for the labor market when people are losing jobs in these, uh, from these companies. But in, uh, for the investor class, that's actually good news because a decrease in labor costs is a good thing for the company's bottom line. So when you look in terms of, you know, what happens uh, on one side versus the other side, when companies have layoffs, the investor class looks at it as, as, a, as a good thing because we all know that, you know, labor costs are the number one big, biggest expense to companies. So when companies are able to um, save on labor costs, it's good for the investor class. They see that as a plus. So that's just kind of like what's happening out in the market this week. And um, I will pass it over to you, Don, unless you guys have questions. Questions, well, comments, observations, requests for the show? Anything? Oh my, then I'm going to be right. by next week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, that, I did have a question about that. Um, Amazon. Okay, so this is one of the crazy things I have been doing this week because I actually blame Emily for this, uh, as I do for most things. She likes to give these like little updates on Friday, um, whether she's feeling like she's going to die or not. She shows up, which I love. And uh, we've been talking about how Apple and Tesla just did their, they're doing their split, right? They're whatever that's called. Well, my question is, are there, I heard rumors, I could be mistaken this, is Amazon looking at doing the same thing? 
I have not heard that in the Rumerville, um, but if they did, again, it would not change any of the dynamics in terms of what Amazon is or anything like that. All they would do would just allow a new entry point for people who might otherwise feel like they cannot touch Amazon, right? Amazon today is sitting at, where are we? $35.95, almost $4,000 a share. So if you're looking to buy a share of Amazon, you're talking about coughing up about $4,000 versus if it does a split, whatever that number would be, whatever that split is, all it does is just bring down that entry level for somebody to be able to get in and buy shares of Amazon. Now, in today's day and age, you can do the fractional shares and stuff like that. So if you're still looking to get into Amazon, you still you still can. But in terms of owning actual, you know, like a whole share of Amazon right now, you're looking at about 30, about, you know, $4,000 to get into to just buy one share. Whereas if they do a stock split, it would be, a, you know, it would be um, available to a lot of people who may feel like it's out of reach for them right now. So it would be a good thing. It would be a good thing for anybody who's looking to get into Amazon. You know what I mean? So, yeah, I have, but I have not heard those rumors. If it is, I would be really, really huge. But um, we're all kind of, you know, keeping our eye on Monday because Tesla and uh, Apple are doing their splits on Monday. So it should be interesting to You're just ready. do that. If you have to, you can sell one of your kidneys and get into it because you know, you've got a second one as a backup. But you want to make sure you're at least recovered enough to hit buy on Monday, just, just, or outsource it to a VA, whatever you gotta do, just make sure you get in on it. Just get in, get in there and get going. I'll right? ask Emily, I'll be like, here's my money, just do it for me and I'll just have it sit there and grow. That's right, thank I'll, you. I'll give you my login information, I'll put some money in and just be like, just do this for me. Yeah, just make that happen, thank you. <laughs> what do you want for Christmas? I want Amazon stock, I want Apple stock. I don't know, is that a thing? Anyway, um, so one of the things, anyway, what I was actually blaming Emily for was if you guys look at, there's a really great um, YouTube channel I just found called Venture City. And uh, I like their way of, I like things you can take something and you can break it down to like a third grade level. I get a lot more interested because I'm, I'm not that smart. So when, uh, but Venture City, it was talking about cities of the future, like what, what that looks like. They talked about what Tesla and what Amazon are doing and how they foresee things going on in the future. It is insane what they've got planned for their companies, their vision for the future, what they think is going on. Um, I don't think Tesla is going to, I, I think that Tesla is going to be crazy. But everything that Elon Musk is doing is insane. He just sold one of his companies. I forgot which one. He made $100,000. He put forty. He put sixty thousand to SpaceX, thirty thousand into Tesla, and ten. Oh, sorry, I'm saying these are millions. Forty, sixty million into SpaceX, forty or thirty million into Tesla, and ten million into one of his other companies. And he had to borrow money for rent. I, I'm just like this man. I I think this is crazy. It's amazing what visionaries can do. But anyway. I digress. So Don is here, Mr. Don Pendleton at Protect Wealth Academy. I'm going to give his introduction in a second, but for him, there's not usually much introduction needed. He's kind of brilliant. He's adorable. I've been dying to have him on my show. I had to actually go and kill someone so he'd actually say yes already. Threatened his family, had to bug his car, stood outside of his window when he was sleeping and just kept knocking until he answered. Now he's much. finally here. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> Don, what, are, what is your perspective on, on what's going on with the stock market and everything that's happening as a wealth expert yourself? What are you noticing? Well, I love I love the growth. I love I love I, I love the fact that you're you're in this and you're educating people. That that so many people are passive and they sit back and they don't do anything and they hope that their market goes up, but they don't actively do anything. The fact that you're actively doing stuff and educating people is really, really positive for me. That's, I believe, I believe in education and I think you can make money whether the market goes up or down. Right now we're having a great bull market. What, What's going to happen with the election and COVID? I have no idea. But um, right now, I'm I'm enjoying the gains in in my 401k, and so I it, it's I, don't, I love it. I'm so glad to hear you. Well, uh, to be clear, I agree. I think education um, is absolutely vital, and I feel like it's something that most people don't realize that they have control over what money is. It's not something that's 
out there that is beyond them. It's not metaphysical. It's a tangible item that you can actually have control over. And what value you place behind it is how you really live your life. So I got amazing, this isn't everyone that's on this call and then everyone that's watching on Facebook and the ones who are gonna watch it later, they're an amazing group of, of human beings that all wanna change the world. So we're really glad that you're part of our mission. And um, we get a lot of questions all the time about various forms of asset protection. We've talked several times about um, how it's not about the money you make, it's about the money you keep and how that actually helps you grow your wealth in the long term. And, and lately we've been working on um, really talking about business credit and credibility. So not only reputation, but about uh, just what you, how you present yourself and, and uh, how you show up to the marketplace and so on and so forth. But a lot of us don't understand how to go about setting up our business to where we're capitalizing from the beginning. Some of the common mistakes that people make, the misconceptions that are out there, uh, and I'd like you to set some of that light on there. What should new investors do? Like, what's the first step you would tell any new investor, whether it's real estate or stock or whatever it be, what would you tell them to do to get started properly? Almost always set up a business. Uh, and it could be an LLC. It could be uh, probably not a sole proprietorship. To a, if you're setting up a sole proprietorship, what you're, you're saying to the IRS is tax me a at the maximum allowable rate, give me the least number of deductions possible. And, and, and to everyone else you're saying, and make me personally liable for everything that goes on in the business. Um, and I, I really, you know, I don't like sole proprietorships. I do like LLCs and you could take an LLC, disregard it for tax purposes to keep it simple, but at least there's a shell around it. And then we look at your legal structure and say, okay, once you start making money, now let's convert that LLC to be taxed maybe as an S corporation and, and take, if there's going to be losses in that business, that loss comes down and affects you. Maybe I could reduce my self-employment taxes. But the fact that you have a business, even if it's only to manage your investment account, now all of a sudden there's things that I, Personally, you can't write off your cell phone. Um, personally, you can't, you know, if as all I have is a stock trading account, that's my business. I, I'm, I'm, invest, I, I'm, I'm setting up a little Charles Schwab to manage investments. That's the only thing I do is, but, but now all of a sudden, if we have a business that manages investments like Charles Schwab, now I can write off my computer. Now I can write off the internet. Now I can write off office equipment and cell phones and internet and travel expenses. Now I can write off um, education. I can write off I, I, medical expenses for my family. Um, now I can write off my health insurance. I can, uh, my home office, all of a sudden, there's a whole plethora of things, even though I'm only managing my, my investments um, but because I set up an investment company, now uh, there's all kinds of things that the IRS says, oh, you have a business. Now you can deduct things. It's so interesting because we've been talking about just that very same thing. Uh, we were talking about last night with investor, with a um, real estate survivor, how you can start building business credit so much faster than personal credit, just by like what you're saying. If you, if you have a business and you're able to reposition some of your personal liabilities as business assets is one of the benefits of having a business. And it doesn't take that much more work than you're already doing as an individual. It's just, you know, making sure your books are correct and you know what you're doing, what through. Most Am people I think that there, um, that there's two sets of, of tax rules and, and really there are. Hi, Dusty. How are you? It's good to see you. Uh, um, and, and there are, I used to think, yeah, you know, one set of rules for the, the rich and, and one for the poor, but it's really not that way. It's for those who have a business and those who don't. And think for just a minute, if you don't have a business, the very first thing and all your, your income is W2, the, the very first thing that you're going to pay is taxes. And you're going to, let's say you make $100,000 and you'd be in a 27% tax bracket. So the very first thing that's taken right off the top is 27,000. If we have a business, the, the rules are so different. 
now now what they're doing is they're they're saying oh you're only going to be taxed on not the income but you're going to be taxed on, not on the gross but on the net after all of your expenses then you're going to be taxed on sort of the profits that's a whole different set of rules where our taxes are almost always going to be lower if we set up some type of a business we love we love businesses because it's it for most people, that is the best way to reduce your income taxes because, again, there's two sets of rules and we're not breaking the law. In fact, we're following the law created by Congress. It's interesting because there are so many, um, there, it's, uh, I won't, well, I won't go there because I'll get political and Emily's hiding herself, so I don't want to do without her here. It's much more fun to see her squirm, so I'll get back to that. But it's funny, when you start a business, it's very much so like having a, a, a kid. And you always want to give your kids like the best um, opportunity that you could. But think of this way, the IRS thinks of your business as a totally different person. It's a different entity. So you're there, your business's EIN is the equivalent of their social security number of your business. So you can do so much more and get your own crap, your own living beliefs and your own mistakes that's separate from this new entity and you can do that correctly. So just having that ability to, to grow that business, to actually, um, to make it something that's doing the best thing for you is really just also the best thing for your business. So I, I really find that's interesting. Don, by the way, Dustin, Dustin Lynn, I don't think you remember this. When we were in Indiana together, remember our cash flow fuel training? Remember being there? Okay, so that was the same time that I actually got to talk to Don for real, for real. And uh, he told me about, he's the one that gave me the idea of making my dog my mascot. <laughs> so he become a tax deduction. I thought it was brilliant. Do you remember that? I've been, I've been trying to tell Josh that now so we can get a new puppy. That's <laughs> so Don, should they set the business up first or get the puppy first? Which one do you think? <laughs> Either way, we just want to, we, we're, we're trying to move things that we would otherwise be called a business exp or a personal expense, and we're going to try to move it to a business expense. If, if you're not going to buy a new computer, don't buy a new computer, but if you are, let's find a way to deduct it. And as a personal, just as all I'm doing is I'm trading in the stock market, I can't write it off. The IRS says, no, the only thing you can deduct is the cost of trading, but not your cell phone not internet you have to have a business and and to have a business it's it's not complicated you have to have the intent to make a profit well, I always have the intent to make a profit there we wow. go so so that defines a business in the US just that's all it requires is the intent to make a profit correct now, now we can formalize it by doing a corporation, but the corporation requires minutes, meetings, resolutions, stock certificates, stock ledgers, um, a lot of corporate formality stuff that you're probably not going to do. If we had an LLC, uh, yes, there's a filing with the state. There may or may not be a tax return, but all of a sudden it opens up a world of deductions that you wouldn't have anywhere else. That's so interesting. It's, it's funny because um, as we go about learning about the minutes, that's something I think most people who have, they'll go and they'll open up a random LLC and they think they can use it for everything. But LLCs are supposed to be specific for um, what you file under. Can you clarify what that's like? Because if you have one LLC, you can use it for everything. Well, yes, um, to an extent you can. For years, I've had five businesses. I, in 2000, I think three, I opened up um, a little company. I, di I didn't know what to call it, so we called it Jamba. Um, Jolie, Ashley, Marin, Brian, Andy, I live in Utah. We have just five kids. Um, so we named it after the kids and, and I did a few tax returns and I'd go out and do some speaking gigs and I would do, um, I'd get some royalties on books that I'd written. And I don't know, we had several businesses that, that we did and we put it all under Jamba and that was fine. And then my wife comes along and says, hey, I want to be a massage therapist. I want to put work on people's necks and spines and backs. And I went, oh, separate legal business. I want, to, I want to take the liability from this and separate it from anything else. So can you do lots of activities under one business? And the answer is yes. 
as all we have to do is expand the business purpose. Um, we, but but that doesn't. Re I mean, you, you do hundreds of businesses in all in your one business, but should you? And the answer is, if there's liability, um, I want to separate my rental properties from my active, you know, uh, management company or, or whatever we're doing. So when you when you're looking at that, because certain businesses can write off certain things in a different way. For example, when I was the dancer, we had to have costumes because that's what we were competing in. So there was no other way for me to actually utilize. The, the expense of a $2,000 rhinestone open chest Latin shirt because I wasn't going to be able to use it for anything else. And by the way, my closet looks amazing. It looked very, <laughs> like, I've got a quarter of it where Cher would just applaud. It's wonderful. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, there's no other way to do it. So we were able to write those off as a business expense because, well, they were. I had to do it for performing. I also was able to write off spray tans, haircuts, massages because your muscles are getting really sore dancing. Um, at that point in time, entertainment, because it was, it was industry research, because I had to know what was going on in the industry. Now, you can't do some of those things now with the new tax laws, but I'm also out of that part of the industry, so I don't have to worry about it. So what are some of the coolest changes that happened in the 2017 Tax Cut and Jobs Creation Act that we should be taking advantage of? Well, let, let's go back to what you were saying, okay. and 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 there are things that you can deduct out of some businesses you can't deduct out of others. Um, and the, if you'll remember the acronym CORN, C O R N, the the expense for your business needs to be customary for that business. If if I can't, most businesses you probably couldn't write off spray tans. And yeah, I mean, but but is that customary for the business? Is it an ordinary expense? Is it reasonable? And is it necessary? And every business is going to have different parameters. So remember that little acronym. But but that will keep you within the black area of the law. Um, I don't know that there ever is a black area of the law, but but less gray than other areas of the law. Remember the, the acronym CORN. What was it? Customary. What was Pardon me? Customary, ordinary. Reasonable. Reasonable. And necessary. Is it necessary for you to have your business in me, business meeting in Hawaii? Mm. <laughs> Dusty's going, yes. Is it, is, it, is it necessary that you have a business meeting on a cruise ship, Josh? Um, we, <laughs> there are cruise buddies. Um, didn't you guys get married or engaged on our cruise? Yeah, and, and I saw you were married. Thank you. And congr congratulations. They just um, posted their pictures. Dusty just posted them like two days ago on our Facebook page. Oh, uh, what a Gorgeous bride, by the way. Um, uh, you see her dress? Her dress is insane. Yeah, oh, beautiful. Those pictures. They were worth it. Congratulations, Josh. You got a you got a great little woman. Um, anyway, I'm so their wedding off as a business expense. <laughs> Kidding. You can't do that, can you? It depends on who you invited. If it were if it was all business clients. I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I, I'd have to get really creative with you on that one. <laughs> um, anyway, so let's go back to your question. And I forgot what your question was. Oh, what are some of the biggest changes that happened in the 2000s? So let, let me let me okay. back up so I can let people be aware. In 2017, we had the biggest tax overhaul that we, well, a very much so needed tax overhaul, the biggest one we've had in decades. And um, the reason why taxes have got to be monitored, guys, is because remember the last time we had a major overhaul, we didn't have cell phones in our hands, right? We have changed as a society. So the tax laws that were in place were no longer relevant. And you know what? The tax laws that were put in place in 2017 aren't gonna be relevant in 10 more years. So there's gonna be, need to be another one. So you have to keep in mind what's going on. There were several changes that happened to the 2017 Tax Cut and Job Creation Act, several of which benefit real estate investors. So um, Don, tell us some of the benefits of, of that, some of the biggest changes from that 2017 Tax Cut and Job Creation Act and how we can take advantage of them as individuals. 
Oh, that's a good question. I've got about six PowerPoints in the background because I had no idea what direction you wanted to go. Let me share my screen and let me show you because that's a that's a really good question. So what am I looking at right there? Share. There you I don't go. know if you can see that or not. I can see it. Can everybody else? Okay. So here was a um, Schedule A for 2017. And here's what's changed. Uh, if, if, if you remember a Schedule A is here's how I, I can either take the item, I can itemize on this Schedule A, or I can take a standard deduction. So if we take the medical expenses, um, we start with the base. The base changed. It, it, it doubled. In fact, it more than doubled. Before that, if you didn't have twelve thousand um, dollars as a married couple, singles just cut it in half. Uh, if you didn't have up to twenty-four thousand as a married couple, um, it wasn't worth filling out this form. Um, now that 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 limit is twenty-four thousand, so it more than doubled. So if we add up everything on this form and it doesn't come up to 24,800 right now, you're better off taking the standard deduction. But if we can, if we can get things and they can, they can add up to um, more than 24,800, then we, then we itemize. So let me show you what changed. Um, it used to be medical and dental. We would add up everything together and, and unless it came up to 10% of your adjusted gross income, it wasn't worth doing. Now that that's been lowered to seven and a half percent. Now I have a C corporation so that I can deduct 100% of my family's medical expenses. But short of that, um, it, uh, of having that type of legal structure, um, we're limited to now to seven and a half percent. So anything, let's say our adjusted gross income was a hundred thousand and we have um, seven and a half. So, so we have $7,501 in medical expenses. That's mileage to and from the doctor. That's medical, anything medically prescribed. Um, if we've got $7,501, now we get to put $1 down on this. Uh, so taxes you paid changed, um, which is really hurting people in tax, states that have high property taxes or high income taxes because now you're limited to ten thousand dollars that's a big deal the interest you pay first mortgages are still tax deductible second mortgages may or may not be depending on what you use the money for the gifts to charity didn't change but because the 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 base changed. You could be no, do, donating to the United Way or Girl Scouts or whoever, and and it doesn't matter because your limit didn't come up to twelve thousand four hundred, or again half of that if you're single. Casualty, lost job expenses, almost everything down below that line is now gone. But the big things is, is, is we we lost a whole bunch of things personal deductions that we couldn't have before. What changed though was real estate. What what real estate, oh my gosh, they added so many things. Losses, um, they, they added oh, cost segregation. They added 20% of your rental income as qualified business income. It's 199 um, K, right? Yep, section 179 deductions. Um, they, they added so many things for the real estate investor. If you're not, we have a lot of people that will, um, that are making too much money in their W-2 jobs or they're um, maybe in the stock market, but we can, we can write that off with real estate paper losses. Not that you lost money, but oh my gosh, there's so much. Uh, think about who's in the White House. You know he's a real estate investor, and uh, this tax law favors real estate investors by far. It's Does that, that answer your question? Yes, absolutely. When I actually, um, when I decided to get my real estate education, it was the, the week after the actual election. Is I found myself in a seminar, as one does, and um, I would have bought anything. I, I knew that a lot of things were going to change, and 
we were right about that. But I also knew that the one thing that was going to probably improve was real estate just based on the administration. So when this tax code came out, a lot of other asset classes had some losses. Like they, they, things were taken away from them, right? Um, such as like, what happened with stocks? Do you remember, can you tell us what happened for stock investors? You can only write off passive gains against passive losses. Um, and you get to write off the cost of trading, which is, you know, your brokerage fees. Other than that, that's really all you can write off. You, you, if you have gains, you can write off um, uh, uh, losses. You can, you're limited to um, $3,000 in losses that you can write off against W-2 income. Um, which means, let's say you make $10,000 in the stock market this year. Um, all of that will be taxable. Uh, it's either short-term or long-term capital gains, depending on how long you held the stock. But let's say you have $10,000 worth of losses, and I want to write that off against some W-2 income. I can't do that unless you're a professional trader, and it's almost impossible to, be, to meet professional trader status. And so that's why we really like the idea of having a business. Let me, let me go to another PowerPoint and let me show you kind of why we do what we do. As a professional trader, you get three choices. Don't do anything. And as a result, you can, you can still write off brokerage fees, cost of trading, and up to $3,000 in losses against W-2 income. But if we had the business, then I can do lots of other things. So option number one, do nothing. Option number two is qualify as a trader. And it's almost impossible to do that unless to be trader status. Um, let me give you, there's the requirements to be a trader. You have wait, to see. Wait, Don, have you switched your PowerPoint? Yes, can you see it? Uh, no. So if you would just close the screen and open it again, that typically is what happens. We're still on the new tax code from the former one. I was just Oh, stop on. share. Okay. Now do it again. Mm -hmm. Now do it again. That's all right. There we go. Okay. Can you see that? Yes. Okay. So if you, if you just, if you were trying to be, do nothing, I, I'm a trader, I, I, I buy and sell in the stock market. Here's what I can deduct, here's what I can't deduct. The other way to deduct things is to qualify as a trader, but the IRS hasn't really given very clear guidelines on what a trader is. Here's their guidelines, and, and they're fairly obscure. You have to seek profit daily from daily movements. Your activity must be substantial and you have to carry on activity that's continuous and regular. And then let me show you how weird this is. Okay, and this went in tax court in 2004. Chen made 323 trades during the year. Um, but it was most of it in just a two month period of time. Okay. And so what he was trying to do is write off his education and his computers and his internet and everything related to trading. The IRS came back and said, no, you can't do that because you weren't continuous and regular. You made all your money in three, four months, and then you didn't do anything for six months. Therefore, they denied all of his deductions because he, his trading wasn't continuous. They are so picky about this and the, the requirements that we go, you know what, I just, I don't wanna play that game. So what we do is, is if you can't tr qualify as a trader, then we create the business. And this is where we say, okay, let's have a corporation or an LLC taxed as a corporation. If you've got a substantial trading account, let's put that in a limited partnership so that if you get sued, they can't touch that. That's The limited partnership is really for asset protection purposes. But now by the combination, we've got the, if you've got a small account um, and, and it's not an attractive lawsuit 
I've got a ten thousand dollar brokerage account. Nobody cares about it. It's not an attractive asset that people are going after. But if I've got a couple hundred thousand, that may be worth protecting for you know. So we put that in a limited partnership for asset protection, and we hire the best manager we know which happens to be my corporation, that's gonna manage the account. Now, all of a sudden, I don't have to qualify as dealer status because the corporation, the purpose of the corporation is, is to manage investments. Mm -hmm. I, I send up a reasonable management fee that's gonna cover um, all kinds of stuff mm -hmm. that I couldn't deduct anywhere else. Does that sort of make sense? John, you are so right on. This is exactly how I set up my trading account. Oh, good, good. And you've got a written comp, your written management agreement. My binder is like I don't know. I don't even know how many pages my binder is. <laughs> I did not do it. I, you know, and this is one of the things. This is one of those things, and I'm sorry to interrupt, but this is one of those things where you cannot be cheap and trying to figure out on your own. You need to hire professional, you know, accounting firms and you know attorneys to make sure that they structure you properly because. One little mistake and one little mishap can literally break or make you. So yep. make sure that you're not trying to do this through, you know, legal zoom or something like that. Hire professionals to, to set this up for you. This is really what we specialize in is the education that comes along with it. I don't care who sets it up. I, 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 I would want you to, to use a professional so that they don't screw it up. But, but then setting it up is half the battle. You running it right and not screwing up the, the accounting, um, yeah. not commingling funds. If, if, you, if your corporation requires an annual meeting, have an annual meeting. Um, if it requires a tax return, do the tax return. Whatever is required to do, what we specialize in more than anything else is the education on how to create structures and how to run them right so that they're impenetrable to a lawsuit or and they, it doesn't create flags for the IRS. That's that's what we do at Protect Wealth. It, it's, you actually show people how to do it themselves. You got like your own do-it-yourself type of business because you educate them, and then you leave it to them to actually implement it. Correct. And or if you want, we can introduce you to the the attorneys that can set it up. But again, uh, if you don't understand the legal structure, most likely you're going to screw it up or you're never going to take advantage of the tax, all the tax the deductions that you could have because you didn't understand the structure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have to say, like, I learn more and more every time I actually do my taxes. I'm like, oh, I could have done that if I, may, if I move this here. It, Correct. It's interesting. Once you start owning businesses, you start trying to do, it don't even be that profitable or all that complicated. but. Um, every time you do your taxes, you learn something different, as long as you're organized, which, by the way, I'm not. So <laughs> I've hired a bookkeeper, which is also a t business deduction. Yay! There you go. Good. So, that's exciting. <laughs> anyway, I thought it was fun. So this is interesting what you have here. So that's all for if you were trading, correct? Correct. Now, you also wanted to talk a little bit about... Intellectual property. Intellectual right. property, yes. I want to talk about intellectual property, and um, we've got a couple of real estate agents that are in this group, and I know that there are some there are some ninja things real estate agents and brokers can do that other people cannot. So, but I'm definitely interested about the intellectual property and trademark patent stuff. Okay, so where do you want to go? There, there's. <laughs> let me let me skip out of that and skip to another screen. Um, where's that at? Mm. Right here. So did that share screen is stopped. And let's open up something different here. Okay, this is a chapter that I, I wrote um, earlier this spring. I don't know, can you see that protecting intellectual property? Uh, yes. Okay, so what it, what it does is it breaks down intellectual property really into four sections, into patents, into copyrights, into trademarks, and into trade secrets. 
and it kind of gives a really good overview of each of those that goes into that went into our new textbook called the asset protection handbook we sell that online for i don't know whatever the hand, i don't know what i think it's 99 dollars for that textbook it's it, it is not a wussy little textbook it was written for attorneys and it's, it has over 500 footnotes in it. When, if, we, if we make a statement, um, we back it up. Here's the newest case law. Here's the, the IRS codes. So this was an addition to that. If you would like, um, Jacob, I can, I can send that to you and you'd send it to anybody on the call if they're interested in this chapter. Yeah. But, it's, but it's a good, um, so um, you had, specific questions what about like copyrights or trademarks or patents or where do you where do you want to go with this so i feel like this is something that there's a lot of confusion around for the just the general public like what is a copyright what is a patent what is intellectual property that's what i find so many people are that, that we don't quite know so for example if someone wants to create say an app uh, or they're trying to create a trademark um, if they're developing a business and they have several different aspects to it, how do you go about protecting each of these? And are they the same? Are they different? And and what do you what questions are you supposed to ask? Really, really good because I think most people undervalue the, the you know the value of their intellectual property. Um, mm -hmm. Small businesses go well, you know, I don't have a big bank account, but but you know, I, yeah, I've got things that are valuable. And if you don't protect your copyrights, your trademarks, your patents, your your domain names, um, all of a sudden, man, those things, th that's the value of your business often. I, I, I wrote a book, and I, but I didn't protect it. I've got a name, but I didn't protect it. So, so having, protecting this, again, th that might be the most valuable asset you have in the business is is your intellectual property so first of all we have to identify it what can be patented what can be trademarked what can't a, 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 let's start probably with the most common thing and that is a, a is a copyright let's say i write a book or i do an app or, or i do something what can be copyrighted almost any any original work that you do can be copyrighted um, okay. And that could be a piece of music, that could be a, a piece a, of dance, an art, a dance com composition. Ab absolutely, mm -hmm. um, those things can be copyrighted. And what we do is we put, we we use a little symbol. It's a C with a circle around it, and we identify that, and then we tell the world, "This is mine." And generally what we do, we're doing is we're putting a little statement that says copyright. We don't have to file this with any agency. We, we, oh. it's, it's a notice to the world that this is mine. And then we, we say who owns it. Hopefully not you, hopefully at your LLC. We'd like okay. to have a little bit of an anonymity there. Um, not put your name out there, but we could. Um, but you'll notice a lot of books have a copyright, um, copyright, um, and the, the person who owns it or the, the, the entity that owns it and the date that you put it in the, the that you, that, you know, the, the, that you put it into service, that you, you made it available. Um, and a lot of people I, I see that are updating their, their copyright. Oh, I, I want it to look really fresh. So I'm going to update all my copyrights so that they're 2020. No, 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 no. Don't do that. If you, if you created something back in 03, keep the copyright of 03. And you can update the materials, but, but keep those original copyrights. Now you can, if you would like to file this with the, with the, um, it's the United States Copyright Office. And that gives further notice. You do this either by web, um, website or you can, you can file paperwork with them. And that puts further notice because I've got very clear, um, 
very clear. I filed this with the patent or with the with the copyright office, but really for most copyrights, unless it's a book or something that has great value, generally just putting the notice on there that this is mine, now I can go back and enforce that. Huh. So copyright is really can be, it, you copyright a lot of intellectual property if I'm, if I'm yes. putting it into, okay. So, and it's more, it can be anything from a composition of an art or an idea to even a um, workflow of affiliations within your business. Am I correct? Mm -hmm. No, no it, you, you, what you're going to do is you're going to copyright anything that has a, an authorship of you, any tangible, uh, generally speaking, you're not going to, you're not going to copyright um, trade secrets. Th those are protected another way. Here's how we run our business. Um, a database, for instance, would generally be considered a trade secret, not copyrightable, because it's ever changing. A database is, um, but but ideas that are specific to you that they're, they're either going to fall under trade secrets or things that can be copyrighted. And I, I think this little chapter will help you identify okay. which one is which. Trade secrets. There's no federal office where I can take trade secrets and, and expose them. Um, but anything that's going to be exposed to the general public, that would be copyrightable. Anything that's going to be, I don't want to, I don't want to give that to anybody. That would probably be a trade secret. Hmm. It's like your grandma's secret recipe. That's been the family forever and ever and ever, but no one knows the secret ingredient. Correct. Ah, trade secrets. Trade secrets. Anyway, what's, your, what's your family's secret ingredient? Correct. Mm -hmm. um, Bush's baked beans, or I don't know. There's <laughs> whatever, whatever you see. Uh, th those would be considered trade secrets. Okay. And and what um, other examples? I don't know. Um, I, and, 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 and and I think this will make a little bit more sense. Um, Coca Cola's secret recipe. That's a trade secret. Nobody's supposed to know what you know. WD forty. Um, what's in WD forty? I don't know. That's a trade secret. It can't really copyright that because if we did and we filed that copyright with the with the U.S. Copyright Office, then everybody knows what the ingredients are. I see. Yeah, I, I don't want to do that. That's a trade secret, and that would be protected differently. Okay, that makes sense. Um, and what about? Um, and so when you patent something, like you patent an idea, I, I, for example, my, um, one of my close friends, he is a brilliant, brilliant man who created the first paint that uh, removes toxins from the air. Okay. Now, he has patents on so many products he's created, but understanding what a, what a patent does and how to file one, that seems to be its own skill set. Could you talk about patents for a little bit? Sure. So if we're going to patent something, now this... This is a very different thing than a copyright. This, for it to be protected, you have to file it. And, and there's different symbols. Let me show you your different symbols. No, well, there, there's your different symbols. TM, look at, look at the bottom of your screen. Mm -hmm. A TM means that I've registered, I, I've, is that I've applied for a patent. Anybody can use that. You okay. should apply for the patent <laughs> if you're, if you're going to use it. But that means I've applied and I'm in the application process. An mm -hmm. R means it is a registered, it has been approved. And, and so there's a lot of confusion on that. You, you really should only use the R symbol um, behind something if if, if, if it's been approved. So, but, but let me go back to the different types of things that can be patented. Um, and if you can see your screen, and, and I don't know how big it shows up there, but there's five different types of things. Generic marks, I can't, I, I, I can't patent those. I can't, I can't patent the word computer. 
it's too widely it, 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 automobile. I can't patent that. Um, the, their descriptive, the, their general, gen, their generic terms that nobody can really patent. Then there's a descriptive mark. And then that's descriptive of what it is you do. Holiday Inn, it took them over five decades to patent their name until Holiday, and one talks about, you know, a vacation and an inn, well, you can't really, that's that's generic. But the, the, the combination of Holiday Inn became so widely known in, in the U.S. that Holiday Inn, Inn now means a specific type of hotel, whether you like it or not, most people recognize Holiday Inn as a oh, so so. But it took them five years to take two descriptive, two generic terms and make that descriptive. Then there's something called generic, or I'm, I'm sorry, uh, suggestive. This is taking something that kind of suggests something about your product, Jaguar. Oh, that means it's going to be fast and it's going to be light and it's going to be Microsoft. I don't know what that, but it's, it's kind of suggestive. Best Buy. Well, it, you know, it's better than, you know, the competition. Copper Tone kind of says what they do, a little bit about it. Um, so, and as we're going up these scales from generic to descriptive to suggestive, then the easier they are to trademark. Or, or, or I'm sorry to patent. Then there's a thing called an arbitrary. It means absolutely nothing. It, it there's no there's no meaning to the word Google, other than well it's got to be their company. Um, Starbucks. What does that mean? It doesn't mean anything. It's just that's the name of the, your coffee. Uh, Kodak, Xerox, Exxon. They, they're they're not they're they're just arbitrary. That's easy to patent where a generic would be almost impossible. And then there's things that are just kind of fanciful. They have no relationship to what you're doing at all, like Apple, Domino's, pizza. Well, a domino is something that falls down. It has nothing to do with pizza. Shell oil. Um, those things are easy to patent, uh, or I'm sorry, to, to, to get a trademark for or a patent for because they're not generic they're not they're not descriptive so so we look at those things and and then we go through the process of applying for for your trademark and this um, mm -hmm. at, at that point it becomes a process Okay. And usually a minimum of a year to get a good patent. Um, it could be, it could be five or 10 years. Um, I, um, a, a patent, you, you probably ought to expect to get it all the way through to registered, probably 35 to $40,000 a minimum. Okay. Wow. But you could you could apply for it, and that does kind of protect your name, usually for at least a year while you're in the application process. Is that what they mean when you say patent pending? You're still in a safe place. Exactly what it means. Awesome. Exactly what it means. Domain names cannot be patented, cannot be copyrighted, cannot be trademarked. Domain names are what they are, and if you stop using it and stop paying. You know your your fees. Anybody else can take it. That I can't. <laughs> if Google ever stops paying their domain names, I could acquire that, I suppose. But I but they can't protect that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's actually interesting. So if we wanted to say, for example, if we were going to do, if we wanted to trademark the term investor party, which is ours right now. That would be a. I'm trying to see which one it was. Over oh, so the other page. Uh, that would just be a, it's not fanciful, it's not arbitrary, is that too generic? What's the word? Investor party. Investor party, two words. Party is, is very generic. Mm -hmm. Investor is very generic. Neither one of those would be um, trademarkable. There the combination of investor party 
it would be very difficult and I think that it would probably take a couple decades to to establish investor party means to the general public nobody else can use this we've reserved investor party just for you I think you get an uphill battle with that naturally because I like to make things hard <laughs> okay so um that's that's really interesting though. So I'm, I've, I'm so interested in this part. I haven't looked much into this area of asset protection. It's just fascinating to me. It's, it's interesting because when I started off, I was a professional dancer and it was a very um, different lifestyle. Um, I, uh, uh, yeah, you can send it to um, info at investorparty.com would be easiest. Um, so, oh, just info, no R. There you go, at investorparty.com. So um, it's interesting to see how creative this side of business is. It really is almost an art. It is. It is. And protecting what you have is a big part of the overall. Here's. Okay. I sent it without. I got it. <laughs> yeah, everyone is uh, sending me messages and they're saying that they will, they're going to be watching this uh, again. <laughs> so I'm excited to see they're actually getting a lot of this information. So um, what are you, what are some things, how do people, what, how can they get more involved in what you're doing and how can they support you uh, in what you're trying to do as far as well, people? Okay, so we're an education company. Okay. We, we, we really, you know, we'll in, introduce you. We're, we're kind of like um, a quarterback. Uh, we, we, what do we do? We don't do anything. We, we, we don't invest your money. We don't do set, set up your legal um, structure. We don't, but we can introduce you to the right people. We're an education company. We, uh, we you know, Aaron Adams, if somebody wants to, um, know one of the best real estate investors in the nation, we can introduce you. Uh, Mike Koval is one of the best stock market investors anywhere in the nation and trainers. If you want some really good training on stock market, we can get you that. But mainly what we do is asset protection. Um, we teach taxes, we teach tax reduction, we teach um, asset protection. Oh, and we teach a three-day asset protection summit that I think any business owner in America ought to attend. Um, you can you can visit us at protectwealth.com. Mm -hmm. You can, um, and in fact, there's a specific link just for your group. It's called go to protectwealth.com. Protectwealth.com forward slash investor party. And if they would like, they can sign up for uh, our three day summit. Now, Dusty and Josh, you're already part of us. Sorry, well, you, okay. Jacob, you're already, you've got our information, but there's tremendous webinars that go on. You know what, let me flip to one other screen that might be helpful. If I can get over to that. All right, so I'm out. I'm gonna share my screen again. Oh, I might need to check. There you go. Okay. Mm -hmm. We're bringing in the best of the best instructors in the nation on asset protection I don't know if you can see that. Are you, are we yeah. up and live yet? Yes, we are. We're bringing in the former senior trial attorney from the IRS to teach taxes. We're, we're bringing in some of the best IRA specialists, um, the best attorneys. Um, Chris Johnson here teaches grants and here's how to get free government money. We've had so Hi, Chris, many of I our students. Like right now, please Chris. Yeah. Chris, <laughs> Chris oh, had, here's opportunity zones. If you, yes, this is a great place to invest, but if you invest across the street, the, then your municipality will give you money to do it. Aaron Adams has flipped almost 10,000 houses by himself. I mean, we're bringing in the best of the best to teach 
income tax reduction strategies. If you'd like to get the, the, the class is normally $995. You can register if you're interested at protectwalt.com forward slash investor party. This is where we're teaching. I, I, I can't tell you how valuable this is. Josh and, Josh and Dusty have been to our class, um, but they attended on a cruise ship. We're not really doing that this year, but we're teaching basic financial education, which I, I got to tell you is pitiful in America. We, we just don't teach that anymore. And we're going back to basics on how to do this. We give you a chance to meet one-on-one -on -one with attorneys, help them develop a customized plan for you. There's an agenda on our website. Here's what we're going to cover. We've got two events coming up, live stream September 14th, um, or we're going to, I don't know if we're going to be able to do the live one. Um, the governor of Nevada is still restricting groups to 50 people. So, but we're either going to do it live or we're going to live stream. If they, if any of your, your people, Jacob would like to attend, we will waive their tuition fee. Just bring them to the class and, and register uh -huh. there. Okay. Perfect. So that's what we do. This is exciting. It, guys, like I said, it's more a matter of when you look at the IRS test code, it sounds crazy. But if you if you look at the IRS tax code and you use it like paint colors on a um, on a uh, oh, where to go? Oh, I stop this. Whoop. Stop share. Ah, ah, there we go. If you use them like paint on a canvas, it'll make a big difference for you. So you can be as creative as you want with all of this. Right. So does anybody have questions? I think Josh has a question. Sure. Okay. Yes, I do. <laughs> Since you mentioned, I had been wondering about it and you mentioned it in your opening about like the medical reimbursement through the C Corp. Yes. So my question is, so, I mean, I do have my W2 government job and I get health insurance through them, but can I, write off the portion of premiums that I pay for my medical insurance as reimbursement. Absolutely. And then, and then from that, then any other out of pocket medical expenses that insurance doesn't cover and whatever can be reimbursed, right? Including, let's go back to, if you can still see my screen, I didn't get out of it. Oh, I shut it um, off, I'm sorry. Oh, did you? Okay. Yes. That would be, that, but I can do that for the whole family, right? Not just for my. Yes, that would be anything medically related to you. So let me share the screen. Mm -hmm. Medical reimbursement. What you'd have to have is an LLC taxed as a C corp or a C corp. Right. Now your portion of insurance premiums can't deduct what the what the company but right. your deductibles your co-payments prescriptions anything that is legally prescribed herbs and supplements if they're prescribed medical equipment if it's prescribed air conditioning if you you, you need it in Southern California where you are dang you know if you've got a health condition that requires you then any mileage to and from the doctor that anything medically necessary specialty foods, physical therapy, not just your medical premiums, your, your portion, but yes, if you have a C corporation and the proper language in your bylaws or your, uh, it could be a resolution, um, but you're going to have the proper language or it would be denied. Well, yep. have, because if it's not, I just need to have a meeting and say, this is what we're doing. doing Correct. Now on, basically. Okay. Yep. Have a meeting and, and keep proper minutes. For the kids, done, like even the stuff that the kids are having done, like Jackson's with them teeth out, we can do that because it was through his insurance. It would be for their employees, which oh, just you two, and your dependents. Cool. So if you've got kids that are not dependents, then no. And then is, is there any personal tax implication that comes from that, like to my personal return, is that considered, or because it's reimbursement, it doesn't count? Or it's not. No, we're gonna write that off out, out of the business. 
um, out of your C Corp or LLC taxed as a C Corp. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Hi, Don. I have a question. Sure. Yeah. Um, so this is kind of like specific um, reference, um, basically nonprofit and kind of with Jacob's nonprofit. And um, so I have. Jacob has the dot profit. I'm setting up a, um, uh, a house. Home, a um, home. I'm setting up a second home um, in Colorado. My mm -hmm. corporation, my C Corp is in Florida. Um, my, my holding company is in Nevada. Um, and so the house itself, I guess, how do you recommend the, the, the structure of that be? Uh, technically, I'm working inside the house, but then the house would, I think it's would kind of be for Sherlock Holmes. Um, so, like, do I just set up an LLC and then rent it to Sherlock Holmes, or, and then do I put it under the C Corp, or do I put it under the holding company, or is there some other yeah. better way to possibly do that? So, let's suppose we did a single member LLC in Colorado that owns the property. We put that in, we, we title that, I'm, I'm, I'm saying we'll just put it in, but, but there's a process of doing that. We, we put, the, the, we, we convey the property to the single member LLC. There's only one owner in a single member LLC and that happens to be your holding company. Now this is separate and so it's a solely owned subsidiary to the holding company. And then we lease the property up to your corporation, which manages, I'm assume, whatever. What's the purpose of your corporation? Your nonprofit? Um, well, my corporation is like a regular C corp, so it would be for you know rentals and anything else. The nonprofit would actually be um, Jacob's housing LGBTQ homeless. Okay, so then we would lease that up to the uh, the. Can I say homeless shelter? Sort of what, what whatever the the nonprofit whatever that is. Mm -hmm. um, Foundation. Okay, so we lease that, and you guys figure out whatever rent is is reasonable. Um, and but but it's held in a set, and then Jacob, your your nonprofit would have to be um, listed as a foreign entity doing business in Colorado. Right, because now it's doing business in Colorado, not just Florida. Well, oh, the entity, yes. Now, the the five hundred one uh, yes. bylaws did specifically mention Colorado Springs, so okay. it's in my bylaws. But as what we were trying to figure out was, do I need to open a secondary LLC in Colorado? Because I know that in order to build our business credit, I do need to have uh, a Colorado phone number. Uh, everything consistent that is within that business wherever it's set up, so on and so forth. So, well, I think sure I think your expansion to... is you you want to have these homes in multiple states, do you not? I want to have multiple homes in every state. Okay, so then you would take the one nonprofit, not set up lots of nonprofits, have one that's registered to do business in whatever states you're doing business in. Mm -hmm. But for the real estate, that's a separate business. That would be um, a single member LLC owned by Jessica, your holding company, leased mm -hmm. to the nonprofit. Does that make sense? That does make sense. Yep. Okay. Now, my question was, because it is still her primary residence, not an investment property, at least by uh, financing standards, what do we need to do to make sure that she is protected? Okay, I didn't know that this is a personal residence. That's been the biggest confusion because it is <laughs> right now. So right now she is protected yeah. because it is her primary residence. I'm not sure where the homestead laws are in Colorado, but because it's her home, there are certain things that she's able to do. If it were purely an investment property, then we'd have a different story. I, okay. I that part out, but. So everything that I told you um, about single member LLC and a holding company, scrap that. We're not going to do that. May I? May I see if I'm right or when I have this my hypothesis? Tell me yep. if I'm wrong. Okay. Putting the property, putting her primary residence into her family trust, and then being able to rent the property out from the family trust into uh, being able to rent it 
that way. The Sherlock Holmes away from her trust. Does that make, am I correct on that? Yes. So before I do that, I would probably, the trust is good okay. because it'll avoid probate. So Colorado will only protect the first $75,000 equity in your home. In a lawsuit, that's all they're, they're going to protect. And so we could suck out some equity, use your Nevada corporation. Uh, I don't know how much equity, Jessica, how much equity you have in the property. She just, um, so it's probably irrelevant. Just if we have a lot more than 75, we would do a friendly lien, use your Nevada corporation, file a lien against the property and, and keep the equity under $75,000. Your trust can lease to the nonprofit but then here's the critical thing is you have to talk to your homeowner's policy, whoever's your, your policy holder on your homeowner's insurance and list this nonprofit as a writer on the policy. If you don't do that, any claims against the home would be denied by your homeowner's insurance. Interesting. Now that's gonna have to, that's gonna increase your policy a little bit, but not substantially. Anytime you're doing a daycare business or any type of business in the home, that those any claims against that, if it's business related, will be denied by the by the insurance company. So list that. Talk, talk to your agent. List the nonprofit as a writer on the policy, R I D E R on the policy, and and that should cover most things. And then keep the equity under seventy five thousand dollars. And in Colorado, Homestead is not automatic. You have to apply for it with your county recorder or tax assessor. Okay. That's actually very interesting. Is that so specific enough? That was that, that actually helped. It clarified several things for me. Um, okay. So move into trust, trust leases to the nonprofit. And, and, and with a rider, the increase in the policy, though, now is a business deduction, isn't it? It's a deduction? No. But to who? Well, you know, yes, it, it could be. But to whom? Because is it a deduction to the trust or to her? The, it's well, not in a business. Well, right? she, but she already has a C corporation. Um, yeah. How would we deduct that? Hmm. Mm, I don't know. Would the could she transfer ownership of the homeowner's policy into the trust as well, or to her C corporation? My my kids just came back. My son just came back from his honeymoon and is waving at me, and he want. I'm I'm sorry, I, and I was waving at him, and I and I totally missed the the question. No, well, that's okay. But by the way, Don's uh, son just got married last weekend. Yeah. Of course, with COVID, that a dad right in their backyard. Yeah. I cannot wait to see pictures of that. Oh my! <laughs> It'll be fun. Um, but anyway, cleanup is not fun, but but the but the wedding was fun. Yeah, that's yeah. why you outsource, honey. You just find someone else to do it. Some yeah. Some people like to use people from Home Depot. I like to use slave labor from the kids. Either way, whatever you need to do. Uh, so, the nonprofit. So the homeowner. So for the deduction, I ask: Is what is it possible to transfer ownership of the homeowner's policy? to the trust or to her C-Corp and then use the writer and all the expenses as a business deduction. No, I probably wouldn't do that. I, I, it, first of all, remember the trust doesn't exist until you die. It, it's just kind of a paper thing that it, it's there to set up uh, to avoid probate. The trust doesn't exist. So if she already has, Jessica, if you already got a homeowner's policy and we and we convert that now to a business policy um, that's going to double or triple your your insurance just if it's your primary residence keep it as a primary residence and just list a writer and it may or may not increase your policy or or not i don't i depends on your agent and the, the company you're dealing with if she so, were just having roommates would that have to happen if she just had roommates in the home yeah would if it becomes a rental issue then it of course it does okay Interesting. because the the insurance now they they thought that this was a personal residence and now you're collecting rent it you, you changed the nature of the real estate didn't you and the insurance company is going to want to know that interesting
this is gonna be fun to figure out in all 50 states. <laughs> oh my God. So I've, I've been running a hotline for 21 years. I've become fairly accustomed to different differences in a lot of states. I'm impressed you just pulled out the $75,000 Colorado equity thing out of like nowhere. I'm like, damn, he's smart. Girl. I run a hotline. I've got access to all, I got a library sitting here, buddy. I appear to be smart, but I've got great reference tools. <laughs> it's all about how you work what you know. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm sure we're gonna have plenty more questions, but I do wanna have you back on. Uh, the dates for your three-day event are September what? And November 9th through 11th and September what? September 14th. Um, it's a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday class. In fact, it's really hard for me to bring in the, the, the brain power that I do on a weekend. And so both of these coming up are Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday class. September 14th um, starts on Monday or Las Vegas, November the 9th. Um, and you're welcome to it. You're invited to attend. We, we love Jacob. We love your group. Um, I would, you're welcome to attend. Thank you. We'd love to be there. We're actually going to be going to Colorado next week. I'm going to be there until the 14th. Uh, and we're doing our, we are remodeling Jessica's home and getting it ready for our. Um, Congratulations. Thank you. It's going to be beautiful. Now we're looking to find, we need furniture. We need donations. We're trying to plug all of that. So, oh, we'll see how that goes. Um, Donna, do you have social media that we can follow? We do. You can go to protectwealth.com protect wealth you can find us on facebook you can find us on linkedin you can find us on twitter i don't know i, I don't i don't tweet and i don't facebook and i've got the stupidest smartphone in that ever created it doesn't know how to do anything but i've got a partner that that is brilliant at this and he posts things all the time i Ask me about limited partnerships and LLCs and corporations, and I talk for days. Yeah, but don't ask you about hashtags and stories. No, I, totally what it is. Yeah. No, not, not a clue. Story. Yep. Tell Kendall I said hello. He's kind of an awesome guy. I, I certainly will. All right. Well, Don, thank you so much for your time today. It's been so much fun. We've learned a ton. We're going to be watching this replay over and over again, I'm sure. Um, is there another question in the chat or anything I'm missing? No? Oh, is Vegas in person? Yes, that one is November 9th through 11th. Right now, it might be in person because it has a 50-person cap, but we'll yeah. see where that goes as we will. We'll have them back on before then. We're hoping, we're hoping this will be live. We, we'd love to see our students. I, I love to teach face-to-face. Um, Zoom is okay, but it's not the same. So, anyway. I want to be able to smell your cologne. That's what I need. That's how I need. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Don Pendleton from Protect Wealth. You're all, always amazing. We so we're so glad to have you here. And um, next week, guys, we are going to be having Jake Lamore coming on talking about different stocks. Uh, we're going to have Virginia Mack talking about real estate as well as uh, having a social for-profit business from the aspect of for ocean they are a for-profit business that actually goes around and re they reduce um uh pollution in the ocean to help protect our environment and then friday we're gonna have don you're gonna love this we're gonna have frank and sherry calendario coming on talking about their uh their shared housing model and how they have taken their vision and turned it into a syndication so come on in and take a listen to that we've got a great week coming next week and then we're going to be in colorado so let's have some fun everybody <laughs> what was that kathy okay well we will see you guys later be blessed be safe and have a little bit of fun take care everybody Mwah. thanks for coming to the party bye bye bye, -bye. bye don